I think Joe is going to come in as a regular participant if you want to promote him, if you see him. Yeah, I'll, I'll promote him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have to put up yesterday's also. I didn't do that. I'm going to see if Camila can help with that tomorrow. Yeah, he posted the PDF the presentation, but. Of uh, Tuesdays? Okay. Mm -hmm. I have to get him the recording or however much of it we managed to get. <laughs> yeah.
Okay, I think I'm gonna broadcast it now. Hi there, welcome to tonight's presentation. We'll be, we'll be beginning right at six o'clock. Thank you for joining us early. Hi, Christina. Christina. Hey, Christina. Hi. Hi. Hi, Stefan. Hello, how are you? We're good, how are you? Good. Hi, Angela. Hey, guys. Welcome again, everyone. We're going to get started in just a few minutes.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last workshop of this winter. So I'm Brenda Diaz. I'm with Dover Cohen Partners. I'm a town planner here, and I'm here with Luisa Leite from also Dover Cohen Partners. She's Hi, everyone. She's a project director for Neptune Beach. You may recognize her. Yes. <laughs> we also have Christina Wright and Stefan Wynn from the city. Maybe. And then we also have Bill Spakowski and Angela Biagi from, um, from WGI, and they're here with us. Um, they're sub consultants to DKP. Good evening. Good evening. So tonight's meeting is being recorded. And again, we want to re remind you all that if anybody wasn't here tonight or couldn't make it, it's always available online. It'll be there tomorrow as well as this presentation. So you can scroll through it if you missed anything and you want to recap anything. So this is a webinar. Some of you guys are familiar with it. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you could submit questions through that. But also since we have a smaller group tonight, we wanna open it up to a little bit more informal. And um, like last time, if you were here on Tuesday night, we um, encourage you guys to raise your hand so that you can ask your questions or if you have any comments, you can speak to the team and um, we'll unmute you. So if you want to at any point, raise your hand during this presentation and during the Q&A session at the end, we'll let you speak your question or your comments. So the agenda for tonight, I'll do a quick recap of a, the timeline and process. We'll do a quick poll and we'll get into what architecture guidelines are versus architecture standards. Then again, at the very end, we'll do a Q&A session. So as you know, this this is the one of the last, this is the very last workshop, but we've had plenty of workshops. Um, we started in December of 2020 and um, we've gone through a series of different workshops, explained a series of things like what form-based code is and how do you get predictable development outcomes. And so tonight's presentation is more specific and detailed and we really get into the nitty gritty of what architectural guidelines are. So again, for the future, you can check back on our website and check to see what upcoming events are, are happening and um, stay in, in the loop for the next coming public events. So we're in a part two and three of a three-phase project. Right now we're working on updating the comprehensive plan and we're going to be updating the land development code. Last year, we worked on the community vision plan. A lot of you guys were involved in that. And so in order for this to continue, we're still encouraging y'all to stay involved and participate and you know have we have community engagement still by creating some of these, we'll have more events where people can come out and speak. Um, so these are highlighted in blue. And just to mention, we are just at the beginning of this whole entire phase th two and three. We're just at the at the yellow arrow right there at the top. And we have multiple milestones, like in April, we'll have the first draft comprehensive plan. And you know, with an opportunity again for public meetings for you guys all to come out. So let's do a quick live poll. This is very simple. Most of you guys have done these before. But again, the instructions are, you'll send a message to the number 22 333. That message is Dover Coal 106. Again, that message is Dover Coal 106, D O V E R K O H L 106. If you have any issues, please let us know in the chat and one of our team members will help you. All right, first question is Have you participated in previous community vision plan events? Send the letter A if you have, send the letter B if this is your first event. So I know I recognize a couple of you guys. Thank you, welcome back. Thanks for coming. So I'll give this a couple more seconds and then I'll lock it and move on to the next question. All right. Second question is, where do you live? 
So you'll send the letter A if it's east of 3rd Street, B, west of Penman Road, C, between Penman and 3rd Street, D, other beaches community, E, greater Jacksonville area, or F, outside of Jacksonville. So we have a range of people. Okay, give it a couple more seconds and then I'll lock it. Third question is what is your age? So again, these questions are just getting an idea of who's in the room or in the Zoom room. And you know, just to get an idea of who's participating and who's participated in the past. We have a variety of people. That's awesome. All right, I'm going to lock it. And then the last question is, what is your zip code? So here you'll just text the actual number and it'll show up on your screen. So we have the Neptune Beach zip code. So the bigger the number gets, the more people are inputting that number. So I'm going to lock it in a couple of seconds. All right. Thank you. So now we're going to get into standards versus guidelines. And I have my very capable team here that will jump in at any point if I need clarification. So what are standards versus guidelines? Standards are mandatory. They require variances or exemptions to alter the requirements. Usually that's by an elected body. And you usually have to prove a hardship caused by the rules if you can't comply with these standards. Whereas a guideline is more of advice or recommendations that, deep, that are not mandatory, but compliance are more in the spirit of what these guidelines are. And non-compliance will be reviewed by a board and, and they have to be rejected by a board or approved by a board. So usually they'll send an applicant to say, to maybe try again. But the difference between these two are the biggest thing is that one of them is mandatory and the other one is not. So standards are mandatory and guidelines are not. So let's recap a little bit. Um, some of our workshops we describe what zoning code is and what and how we got there and how you know these kind of influence the built environment and where you are. So in the code you can regulate items like the ones listed here, but the, the code only really started about 100 years ago. And even just 60 years ago, parking standards only really became a thing. But then later they started adding things like landscape standards and signage standards. But still at this point, people are not really happy with the results. So what do you, what do, you do to create something that you're more happy with or a built environment that you're satisfied with? So a zoning code are more like rules of a game. For example, it tell you how to do something, but it doesn't really tell you whether it could be successful or not. So they don't really guarantee a win. Sorry, there's a typo there. But there is a thing such as like a playbook that could guarantee maybe a more successful character. So for example, these two images show if there is a good playbook, recommendations or more detailed establishments or um, standards, you can get something like the top image that has better architectural characteristics as opposed to the bottom image that isn't really as please, aesthetically pleasing and isn't really up to the street. So in order to repeat a success, we need to analyze what we did well and how we did it well. So for example, like in Charleston, this example shows you how we can incorporate some of these tried and true um, great examples of um, building placement, street, street design, and the character of a space, including building architecture and things like that. So creating these rules we can of a space that we already know, we can take that example and maybe recreate it in a different location. 
So again, architecture standards versus guidelines. So your standards are mandatory. And in recent times, in more recent times, they started adding historic district guidelines. So these were used to preserve the architectural character of a neighborhood or a place built before zoning. So this is more to preserve the character. But then again, if that doesn't work, how can we incorporate something where we can actually build character or enhance the character of a community that doesn't have the historic character already in place? Hey, Brenda. Mm -hmm. So I'll just kind of summarize a little bit too. Um, so we have zoning codes and those regulate basic things like use and height and uh, the position roughly of where a building will sit on the site, where it'll face out to. Um, and those started mostly regulating use back in the 1920s. Um, over time, people felt that there were more things that they wanted uh, to be included in those regulations. And that's when you started to see things like parking requirements and later on landscape and signage standards. And like Brenda mentioned, um, for a lot of communities, they still weren't getting the results they wanted. And so you started to see historic districts popping up um, and that gave cities a way to regulate more closely um, in special parts of the city where the character was um, something that needed to be preserved and, and wanted to be preserved. Um, and then after that, you saw, began to see something called architectural guidelines um, and form-based codes, which started really in the 80s and 90s to be a tool that um, began to be developed. Uh, and of course, now there are some communities that choose to implement something called architectural standards, which Brenda will exp has explained is even more um, strict in how it's regulating the precise style, look, um, and aesthetics of a building. So there's all these various layers um, that you can use in your zoning code, and it all really depends on what you as a community wants and how strict you get. Thank you, Louisa. So going off of that, the question really here is what building design elements should be controlled and how strict do you want to be? So again, architectural guidelines are more offering advice and recommendations. So they're more soft. They're not really mandatory. Whereas architectural standards really have more measurable requirements are mandatory and would require a variance from a board. But even between the, even with those two extremes, you have a range that can really um, be somewhere in the middle between those architectural guidelines and standards. So it really depends on how strict you want to be. So what are these architectural elements? We'll go through them one by one, but this following can be specified in a set of architectural design guidelines or standards, depending on what the community wants and how strict the rules are desired to be. So here, one of the architectural elements are building compositions and proportions. You can, really, you can really establish what you want a building facade to look like by having bay proportions in place. So for example, this first diagram shows you what that would look like. Then you can really get into also the base dimensions and things like that, or a facade composition that really explains where you want a tower to be and what type of um, building elements you want within the middle part of central portion of a building. Again, you can also, you can really incorporate um, things like center lines, cornices and expression lines again to really establish maybe the look and feel of a building, but this these images also show that that won't get you a cookie cutter result. You'll still have a variety of buildings and styles. So the next element get into windows and openings. We call this fenestrate. We can get into fenestration. And so you get into um, facade transparency. And that really, the goal here is to show and to have, to not have blank walls. Um, windows and doors can really enhance this uh, building, especially on the ground floor, if you have retail. Here again, we're showing an example of how having these type of 
standards can really still give you a variety of looks and looks and feels for buildings. You won't get the one what the same looking building over and over, but you will get an architectural style. Next, you'll get into towers and other building elements that you can really describe the placement, location of them, and look and feel of them as well. And then you can have you can get into porches and galleries and balconies. You can get into the location and placement of these as as well as the architecture style and even get as detailed as what the details of the railings look like and what you want to prohibit if you want to. And lastly, you get into materials, building materials and signs. So in these building materials, you can get into colors, what type of masonry you want. And for signs, you can get into the placement of signs on building facades. So let's talk about architecture styles. So this is something I mentioned earlier, but some of these locations, some of these spaces, places that I'm going to talk about are very iconic, something, you know, places that a lot of people are very familiar with. And I'll, I'll jump in, Brenda, really quick to clarify. You don't have to regulate architectural styles or limit them if you don't want to. So you should think of all these things that Brenda is presenting as a menu, um, options that you could choose to regulate. And it might be that some make sense uh, for a particular neighborhood in Neptune Beach and others maybe don't. Uh, but these are some examples of what other cities have done to preserve a specific type of architecture in their city. And to be extra, extra clear, just since we know we're recording and somebody is going to deliberately get confused. Brenda is not about to suggest that you make your architecture look like New Orleans. She's instead going to use the city of New Orleans as an example of how regulating certain things gets you uh, a, a, an immersive environment, of things that go together in a set. And, and so you can ask yourself the question, how much do you want Neptune Beach's version of that uh, to bring things together into harmony and or not? Okay, just using New Orleans as an example, not proposing New Orleans for Neptune, for whoever was just about to put that on Facebook. Thanks. I'll also add one more thing. You don't have to limit it to one style. There are cities that offer a variety of different appropriate architectural styles to ensure that there is some variety and diversity in architecture as well. Right. And the same thing that Victor said applies to all of these examples, not just this um, example of New Orleans. But yeah, so we're using this as just an example of how they how they achieved the style and how they preserved the style. So here, as you know, New Orleans is very famous for their balconies and porches, and they've been able to preserve this style um, by using these guidelines that really um, depict and really diagram what type of railings are um, encouraged and what type of railings are not encouraged or prohibited. The next example is Charleston. Although there's a, a wide range of architecture styles here, they've been very consistent by creating these guidelines that really encourage the type of placement and um, details that really fit within the character of what's already there. And so this is how Charleston has been, been successful in keeping this great um, character and preservation of their, his, their history and architecture. So coming down to Florida, so Coral Gables is also a good example. Their downtown is, you know, can range from two stories to larger, but even in their downtown having this very clear style, you can also get that in your single family residential areas and neighborhoods. So in Coral Gables, they have a pra best practices manual and um, they get into more details as far as like even roof details, materials, um, what type of balconies. And as you can see, you get a really great um, consistent uh, character throughout the neighborhood. Here in Delray Beach, also a coastal community, you, they didn't really have a clear depiction of their architecture styles, but however, their new guidelines have set a list of architecture styles that they want to encourage in new development or renovations. 
And their architecture styles range from anything from Florida vernacular to Mediterranean revival and Art Deco. So these guidelines are really just encouraging these type of styles so that the community can have a, a good consistent character and sense of feeling when you're walking around. And here's another example, a coastal community here in Florida, Bradenton. What they've done in this community is they've set standards and even encouraged specific architecture styles within certain transit zones. So for example, they have encouraged Gulf Coast or required Gulf Coast vernacular or mercantile um, only in T4, T5, T6. So you can really get into that kind of detail. Um, this is just an example of how, how much of a requirement or what type of requirements you can set forth, um, but they have a range of existing architecture styles from Florida vernacular, Mediterranean revival, and um, other things like that. So what is existing in Neptune Beach? You have a lot of things already in Neptune Beach. We have, we see Maritime, Florida Vernacular, Anglo-Caribbean, Main Street Vernacular, but we really want to hear from you and what is it that you guys like or what is it that you want to discourage as we move forward with updating the code. So let's open it up to Q&A. Also want to remind you all that you're able to raise your hand if you want to um, speak your question or ask your question. We're a smaller group tonight, so we really want to make this informal. And um, if any of you want to if, or have questions, also you can also just type them in the Q&A button. I will respond to a comment here about not wanting Neptune Beach to be like the destination cities, some of which you showed. And I'll say that we did show some which are famous for their architecture, but cities like Bradenton and Delray Beach are very much local cities. Um, they're not large tourist destinations and it's completely up to you. We have heard throughout this process that some people um, really like the eclectic style in Neptune Beach, but that there's maybe some newer buildings that don't fit with that, um, that are not really adding to the character. And so this is one way to ensure that you're not getting some new types of homes or Main Street buildings that seem like they're coming out of left field and don't really vibe and mesh with all the other styles that you see. And like I mentioned, you could have multiple styles that are permitted um, based on the buildings you all like and cherish that are existing in the community. Um, and you can have varying degrees of how strict those regulations are. If they're just recommendations and um, guidelines that you'd encourage people to follow uh, to make it easier to get their project approved, or they could be flat out requirements that would require some kind of variance to not comply with. So there's a little, if you look at your Zoom window uh, next to, you have your mute and your uh, Q&A button, there's a chat button and there's also a little hand symbol. So that's the, that's the raise your hand if anyone does want to ask a question live or has a comment. One thing I would like to add, um, ask Louisa is um, in other communities that I've been, like when we've created design standards um, in order to preserve um, some level of freedom and um, you know architectural diversity and eclecticism, which seems to be kind of the um, you know the feedback that we've gotten throughout the community and a lot of our processes, we've used kind of a, a menu approach based on um, you know um, standards that will create a very diverse like some of the the um, the architectural. Um, features that Brenda went over at the beginning of the presentation. And I was wondering if you all have 
package things in that way or is it usually very I mean I know like some communities like say for, New, for example New Orleans or you know the other ones you showed they have a very clear character um, or a style whereas you know we, you know our community be more eclectic you know if the intent is to improve the quality and the um, materiality or the um, complexity of design um, have you all found that a menu approach has been successful in other jurisdictions? Yeah, and, and like I mentioned, style, you don't have to actually limit the architectural styles. That's one thing you could include in your, in your design standards. But you could also just be regulating things like um, building proportion or elements like porches and where they should be located. Um, and some of that is covered in a form-based code already, um, but other things like the amount of fenestration, which is just window openings, the percentage, particularly on your main street with retail ground floor that's uh, retail commercial, you may want there to be a certain amount of transparency next to the sidewalk. Um, so those are the kinds of things, cornice lines, um, you know, you want buildings that create on your main street uh, specific consistent, say, roof line for that first floor. And so those are the types of things you can regulate that don't necessarily dip into style. So style is something you can add on top of that, and you can add many different kinds. So you don't have to limit it just to one, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like in other places like projection and massing and you know, maybe you have two material changes or color changes or something like that to create more visual interest. Yes, um, absolutely. Or limit the number of material changes so as not to create cacophony. It's also on the other side of that same coin. Maybe one way to think about this whole discussion, just to zoom way out, is to think of the architectural standards and their strictness as like a, a throttle. You can throttle way up, you can go, you can go really far in that, or you can uh, keep it really minimal. And one of the things we heard a lot over the past year was that people wanted the rules, all the rules related to development to be more strict. They felt like things were happening that they didn't like, and they thought, well, the problem is our rules aren't strict enough. Okay, architectural standards are one of those things where you get to decide how strict shall we be? We can you can regulate it just a little bit, put a few quality control things in to maybe perhaps prohibit a few materials that tend to come out tacky that you don't want to include. Plastic uh, latex backlit awnings, for example, it's a good thing to prohibit. Uh, that for example, uh, that would um, that be the the minimal, and then the maximum would be adopting one or more architectural styles and specifying how the, the components of those styles go together. In between, are, well, there's a whole range. So what we'd like to get a sense from you tonight about is, where do you see yourself falling on that range? Uh, little or no architectural control, which is where you are now, um, or a little more than you have now, a lot more or somewhere in between. How am I doing, Joe? Does that, does that uh, make sense? Um, yeah, what I was, I was going to give a for instance, um, and which is something that I noticed uh, when I was a lot younger and kind of new to this, was that we were seeing, um, you know, we were seeing places that, that said, well, we, we want to see front porches in, in the neighborhood. And so the, the builders were building front porches, but I don't know, they were like three feet, two and a half feet deep. And so it was kind of a joke for us as architects because we're like, well, yeah, you know, when you look at the when you look at the building face on, it looks like there's a front porch, but who could sit out there other than the dog or the cat? Um, and so putting uh, putting regulations in for like a front porch that has a depth that's usable that you could put two chairs at, at and have a sit at and have a conversation um, is better. Uh, and other than and maybe, uh, you know, the alternative is maybe it's better not to have a front porch at all if it's, it's if it looks like it's um, something's wrong with it. So, oh, so to carry that one a little bit further. So that's one set of, uh, of rules you could put into an architectural uh, thing, a character uh, code. But um, 
you know, then do you want to specify, you know, is, are, is, do all porches need to be made out of wood or uh, what materials can you make porches out of? Um, and, and that's something that is probably less important than making sure that you have a, a porch that was going to be functional. Just in that example, there's a whole, whole bunch of others. Hi, this is uh, Councillor Chen. I just wanted to uh, interject that as a designer myself, I often find that um, I encounter clients who really have no clear idea at the beginning. And oftentimes I have to provide them direction or multiple options before they can start to wrap their heads around a concept. And I'm wondering if that's possible here you know, because I, I think a lot of people who are not familiar with uh, architecture or uh, anything of this nature, they're probably at a loss. When you ask them, well, what do you guys want? They're probably going, I'm not sure how to answer that question. So perhaps if we could just start seeding the conversation with some ideas just to get them rolling, it might be helpful. Sure. And I, I think if there are specific examples of projects that haven't been well received in the community or, or some that are really loved by the community, that's really useful for us to know too. Um, that's the best way for us to, to build the best code is to see what has worked well or what hasn't worked well, make sure that those are the things that we're either prohibiting in the future or encouraging. Um, you know, I, I was struck by Brenda, if you could go back to the images um, in the last slide. Could, yeah. So um, in the Beaches Town Center, you have some really great architecture and buildings. You have um, Hawker's Building and that's new construction. Um, but you also have Pete's Bar, which is kind of this wonderful historic landmark of the town um, that's been there from right from the beginning and something that's really loved but from a design perspective it would be interesting to know for example if pete's bar which you know has clearly been retrofitted and maybe had more windows on the outside at one point than it does today um, but really doesn't have too much transparency or, or space to put any kind of chairs outside um, you know, it's very close to the sidewalk, very close to those trees. You can basically only get palm trees there. Um, and, it, and it's dark. You don't really know what's going on the inside. And you can contrast that, for example, with um, hawkers and some of the other buildings nearby where there's, you know, a lot of light shining through at night. Uh, those buildings are glowing um, and you can tell there's a bunch of activity and people inside. And so those, that's kind of a simple example um, to get away from the residential, but even in the Beaches Town Center that you could regulate in the future. We can say, you know, we, we want all of our buildings in the town center to have a certain, at least a minimum amount of transparency on the ground floor um, and some space to have, you know, outdoor seating of some kind. Um, so th that's one example of, of two buildings that are fairly recognizable um, that are different. And if, if there is a developer in the future who wants to come and say, put a new building where there's some surface parking, in, which is perfectly plausible thing that could happen, how would you want that new building to look? Would you want it to look more like, um, say, the Hawkers? Or if it were to pop up and look more like Pete's Bar looks like today, is that something the community would be okay with. So that's that's one example. And talking about the awnings, Victor mentioned that the types of materials on the awnings, um, uh, you can also see the difference in those too. So, and signage as well. You can encourage things like neon signage, which you already have in your town center or make that a requirement, for example. That's one thing to, to think about. I think it would also be helpful to people to, um, I think, help 
clarify or firm up the distinction between, you know, architectural guidelines and uh, something that is closer more towards the the handling the form of a place because a lot of people they will have uh, more issues with a, a home if it starts to feel like it's encroaching on their space you know so I, I think it goes more towards uh, you know building lines and uh, setbacks uh, and controlling parking whether or not somebody's your neighbor's parking is overflowing onto your property or it may not even be in your property. It could be like uh, they're always parking in front of your place, even though that's in the public right of way. So I think a lot of people are, are interested a lot in focusing on how to control those aspects of uh, right. their daily life. And yeah, something, can, go ahead. And, okay, yeah, and if you can somehow help them understand a the distinction between controlling that versus style. Sure. You know, well, let me or how take style a can it help? I don't know. Well, let's let's talk about it a little bit. The um, so, so there were three questions in there. First one, um, council member, was firming up the dis distinction between guidelines and standards. Let's take one more crack at that. Um, guidelines are soft, meaning uh, you read them and you think about different ways you might choose to. Uh, say you comply with them, then you make your argument, but so and you present your design, some supposedly uh, following or inspired by the guidelines, but the guidelines don't have a lot of uh, hard and fast dimensions or rules. They tend to to say should not shall, and then someone uh, has to in authority has to review the design and pass judgment on whether it sufficiently well complies with the intent of the design guidelines or not. So it's a basis for negotiation between someone in authority and someone who's an applicant. Now, uh, that someone might be an appointed member of staff. More commonly, it's a board. And that's what Brenda was describing, some kind of appointed committee um, to whom the authority to judge projects on a design review basis uh, has been delegated. They, um, the good thing about guidelines, which I'm describing first, is that they're wide, they're pretty wide open, they're flexible, they're, it's not uh, all written down exactly what you have to do. But that is also the problem with them, because it means that you don't know going in what you might or might not get approved, uh, because someone in authority is going to sit in judgment of whether your thing is good enough. And they're going to use the guidelines as their legally mandated um, basis for the decision. But the softer you write them, the more trouble you're going to be in when people dispute the conclusions of that person or persons, that board in authority. So uh, it, it does set the stage for uncertainty. Um, it's, it is used by many communities, to be frank, as a way of intimidating development away, scaring people away. Don't go there because you can't tell what you're going to be able to get approved. They have a lot of stuff in a manual, but you don't know going in, whether uh, whatever you propose is going to be good enough for them. It's hard to predict. So that's the disadvantage for an applicant. Um, and the applicant might just be your, your, your good friend, your neighbor from down the street that was just trying to get something fixed on the front of their house. And then they, they went through this discretionary review, the outcome of which was uncertain. Standards, by contrast, are rules. They're very spelled out. They do have dimensions. They say, do this, not that. So certain things are required. Other things are prohibited. And maybe a still a third category of things that are described in standards can be um, designated as permitted if approved in, in, the, in the review. The purpose of that is to take that uncertainty and shrink it down. Nothing's perfect. You still will have a matter of interpretation to do. But it's much, much clearer whether to you as an applicant, before you ever go to City Hall with your proposal, whether what you're proposing complies or not. Now, because it is more strict and you lose the inherent flexibility of having it wide open, there probably needs to be some other way to get to an approval uh, if you just don't want to do what it says. Like suppose that you have such an innovative architectural design or you're just such a, a brilliant idea that nobody ever thought about before, 
you need the you feel like you need to propose it and you must figure out what you want to do. There needs to be somewhere you can go. Could be, again, could be the planning board, could be an appointed authority, authority could be the city council, but you uh, need somewhere you can go to say, I haven't complied, but I still think I have a pretty good idea. Do you agree or not? And that uh, brings back a certain level of uncertainty. For all of the other projects that do comply or you know, are able to read the rules and say, fine, I can do that. I can make the porch six feet deep instead of three feet deep. And it'll both look right and function as a porch. Uh, they just do it six feet deep. And then the staff can review that, approve it, and it's done. doesn't require discretionary review. So there's a huge benefit to standards over guidelines and that applicants can tell what they are likely or uh, not likely to get approved. So that was the first question was how to firm up the difference between guidelines and standards. Now, on the second part of your question, council member, was about things that bother people, uh, like their neighbor parking on their grass or in front, in front of their property or on, the, or on their property, or their neighbor doing something obnoxious, like um, noise or, or uh, some way that they're maintaining or not maintaining their house. Architectural standards don't do that. They don't control where people park. They don't control where the building sits on its lot. That's done in another part of the zoning code, the same part that regulates setbacks or build two lines. Um, the amount of parking they have, whether their parking is sufficient or not enough, that's also governed by another part of the standards or the code, not the, not the architectural part. So the architectural part has a limited mission to do. It doesn't try to do the things that are better handled in, in another more uh, um, customary part of zoning. I hope that helps. Um, Louisa, it looked like you were you were waving me down there. Was that too long? Yeah, sorry. No, no, that was fine. I, I will say a form-based code will take care of some of these issues already that we've heard um, about where the parking is located. Um, I've heard uh, that there's been complaints about accessory uh, uses and structures, like projecting porches that, you know, um, speak to what you you mentioned about people feeling like um, you know their neighbors right on top of them because their porch is basically right up over the, the fence between the two houses and so those are things that in the form-based code itself uh, you can regulate and ensure that that's not something that's permitted um, and you can have specific regulations for uh, the size the height of you know second floor balconies patios porches all of those things parking location as well. Uh, architectural standards or guidelines allow you to take a, an additional step in controlling the um, predictability and quality of design. And it's optional. Um, we mentioned in the form-based code meeting, there's a couple of things that are optional in a form-based code and a couple of items that are required. And one of those optional items are architectural standards. And it could be that perhaps they're not desired for the residential areas, but maybe are most important for the town center, for example. So that's completely uh, doable and something we could specify that you know certain standards will only apply to one smaller area. So um, something to consider as well. So we have someone that raised their hand. All right, I'm going to allow you to talk. You should be able to unmute now, Charlie Miller. Hi, this is Charlie Miller. The question I have is, what would be the best or preferred method to prevent the repetitiveness of a structure or being repeated up and down the street uh, exactly the same? Uh, what could be as a guideline or a standard to prevent that from having the same type building over and over and over again? Uh, and it looks like a bunch of row houses. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, all those people in Georgia and London have uh, with those beautiful repeated uh, Georgian terrace houses, uh, which are identical one to the next in many, for, you know, for several in a row. 
uh, aren't really having much problem with that because the thing that's getting repeated is really beautiful. Where the trouble comes in is when what gets repeated is kind of is kind of uh, mediocre or worse. And then even if you can stand having one of them in your neighborhood, having a hundred of them in a row is really a problem. So uh, there are different ways of handling it. I, and I'll throw out one, Joey, I bet you can add two or three more. The, in the city of Winter Springs, Florida, for example, uh, they have a limitation on repetition that says how many in a row of something identical you're going to have before you have to introduce uh, a variation. And I think, I think it's, I think it's three. I think they got, they're allowed to have three townhouses or something. I don't remember what the, what the exactly what it is, but in a row before they have to introduce an alternate or different unit uh, design, you can, that a rule like that can be impl in, uh, imposed. Remember that's a new requirement, whatever rules we put here are new requirements. So you have to be thinking from the point of view of a property owner, very protective of their property rights. If you're imposing new rules, you should add uh, new requirements that might add cost or, uh, or just, uh, just limit their flexibility in some way that wasn't limited in the past. Uh, it's a good idea to, to balance that out with new flexibilities in another area. For example, if um, they have to follow these new rules, but you are allowing them to um, make the parking spaces the right size instead of oversized, or you're allowing them something else that from a property use point of view, feels like it compensates for the imposition of new rules, what, repetition and otherwise. Joe, what, what would you add to that, what I just said? Well, the, you mentioned townhouses and I've seen it where they've said no, no more than X number of units can be attached in a row. Um, but I've also seen it, I think that's probably most effective is, a, is by saying uh, no floor plans uh, can be repeated. Um, either, either, I've, I've even seen it side by side. Um, and so that, that's in a case where you've got more, uh, let's say single family houses or detached uh, main street buildings where you purposely wanna make sure that there's not this repetition. Um, paint color has been used, but then, you know, if you've got the, but you have to have the, you actually have to have the facade uh, varied um, because if you put the same building and then do different colors, it can look a little silly. Um, uh, and sometimes people think that you're being uh, uh, unduly har uh, difficult by doing that and they'll choose colors that are just, you know, they'll still comply, but uh, to if there's color guidelines, but it, it's almost like they're trying to make fun of you in a way. Uh, we've seen that happen. Um, but yeah, there's you know you can you can you can say you know how, how wide how wide a space is between uh, doors uh, and and fluctuate that. Um, you can ask for certain architectural elements um, that be varied uh, if if you were supplying a menu of them. Um, so th there's a whole bunch of ways we can try to combat that. And, and I imagine that comment comes from uh, what we see from so many production builders here in Florida, where they'll, they'll have one floor plan and then they just repeat it, you know. I think that's what Charlie was getting at. Yeah, with the same tree, the same one tree gets planted in the, in the yard. If that, <laughs> if, if any trees at all. Uh, we, we did find one example in Switzerland I thought was interesting. Their, their rule was that um, you could paint your house any color you wanted, as long as it wasn't exactly the same color as the one on either side of it. And th there was their objective was to get that polychromatic appearance. Again, the folks with all those identical houses and that are all the same bone color in uh, Georgia and London would probably disagree with that. But that was their local uh, choice. And they were seeking to get some local distinctiveness out of the out of uh, the variety and the color. They were, they were worried about having everything in the same. That's Neue Altfield in Switzerland. Um, their rule is any color you want, just not the color of the one next to you, which, which did force some creativity, um, you know, when uh, people start doing individual buildings. Mm -hmm. These are the sorts of things. So it's the, the number of things you can choose to try and get local distinctiveness like that are, is vast. So one way to go back into it is, well, what is it about some of the existing buildings that you have that you really, really like? We heard a lot of people say they like the Hawkers building, for example, and it's really rare to come to a town, um, especially one where development is in itself controversial. 
uh, like yours, where uh, a lot of people cited one of the newest buildings as one of their favorites. That was that really stood out. There's a lot of other towns and in, in, uh, in the in your region, and in our state where the newest buildings are the least well liked. Um, so I thought that really stood out to us. Well, I would put uh, to the audience first of all: Are you among the people who agreed with that? And if so, what was it about that building that made you feel better about it than some others? I will add to what Victor and Joe mentioned. If it's very important uh, to not get these production mass produced homes that you see in Florida communities, and if that's something you really want to prohibit, then that would be the kind of rule that you would want as a standard and not as a guideline, just as an example. Sometimes it's just as important for the things you want to prohibit <laughs> as to the things you want to encourage. We have have we exhausted all the questions? Yeah, we have time for a couple of minutes for a couple more questions. If anybody has anything they'd like to say, um, even you can raise your hand or just a comment or observation. And if you want to stray outside the boundary of this topic, mm -hmm. that's okay. We're working on all aspects of this. The same folks are working on the architectural standards are also involved in other aspects of the land development code or in the comprehensive plan. There was a question uh, in the question and answer that I think might interest other people as well. Uh, a couple of questions. One is that um, that the this discussion of architectural design standards and guidelines seems a lot like form-based code. And uh, there are a lot of communities who have architectural standards who don't have a form-based code, and there are communities with form-based code who don't have architectural standards. So um, again, it's it's not they're not one or the other uh, that they can be combined or either can be proposed separately. Um, and a, a related question had to do with, um, you know, one of the things we're trying to avoid in Neptune Beach is, <clears throat> you know, uh, overly dense development and, and, and eliminating PUDs. And again, that uh, form-based code doesn't presuppose that you want high density. It doesn't presuppose you want low density. Uh, Form-based codes have been used to produce lower density and to produce higher density. Again, it's just how the code is written, so it doesn't it doesn't presuppose one or the other. Um, as to PUDs, uh, the, the PUD a kind of approval that you've seen in Neptune Beach is, it, in in some ways, it's one version of what Victor described earlier about design guidelines, where it's a negotiated approval. Uh, in, in the case of PUDs, it's negotiated with the elected officials rather than with a board that's been uh, appointed just for design purposes, but it's negotiated. And, you know, the outcome of that can be good or it can be bad, and it's pretty hard to know. Uh, elected officials tend to think they're going to, you know, get the, the best of developers on that, but I think developers often get the best of elected officials because they don't have to do things in the sunshine and in public. Uh, it's just hard, harder to negotiate when one side has to talk about everything in public and the other side doesn't have to. Uh, but again, uh, we, we've seen frequently codes that use, rely on PUDs a lot, switch to form-based codes where things are more predictable uh, about what's going to be allowed. Uh, and this often happens after a PUD is approved that people really dislike the outcome. And they say, you know, well, that didn't work so well. You know, we thought we were controlling development and we got a you know, a much taller building or much larger building than what we thought, and let's go to something more predictable. But on the other hand, uh, we also had, uh, see codes all over the state that uh, allow PUDs in one zoning district and have a form-based code in another zoning district. So um, again, it's not completely one or the other, uh, although the tendency is to replace PUDs with, with form-based codes. And just uh, for the public's edification, for the people who um, haven't heard yet, the city council uh, did direct staff to uh, restrict any 
residential in uh, mixed use commercial zoning moving forward. So, you know, for people who may be concerned about that, you know, I just wanted to let them know that the council did, did direct the staff to uh, restrict that from happening moving forward. Great. Well, if, if any of you or your neighbors are talking about this, have any or feel strongly one way or the other about uh, a certain look or style or building elements that you think are appropriate or just any examples you'd like to show us from the community that you particularly like, um, you know, feel free to email us. You can uh, send us emails through the project website, neptunebeachvisionplan.com. There's some forms there for you to provide any comments. So, you know, we're just going to get started with the code now um, as we're wrapping up these winter workshops. Um, and we hope that they've been informative and, um, you know, you've been able to learn a little bit kind of the mechanics of how coding works and the, the types of things we're looking at improving and you know, all of these are recorded and on the website if you ever wanna revisit them. Um, and if you have any additional questions, you can always reach out to us. All right, thank you all for joining us in this last workshop. Um, here's the timeline, the key, um, the timeline for the key milestones, just to give you an idea of where, when we'll be back to present future things. But like Louisa said, please check back on the website as well. Thank you all. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.